And I need you, a oh, pleasure to meet you as well. So let me introduce you to the guests. We have Stu, and we also have Jonathan. So um, you both are mic'd up. So let's start with Jonathan. Jonathan, tell who you are. And uh, for those who don't know what this topic is about, we're going to talk about connecting with the people in the city and wearables in government. So go ahead and share a little bit who you are and what we're kind of going to talk about. Just a little history. Sure, yourself. you bet. Uh, well, good to see everyone here. Uh, it's great to be part of a conference that's so leading edge. Um, it's really unusual. We're still trying to figure it out. We're talking about it. Right? Um, so I'm the, I'm the chief information officer and the chief innovation officer for the city of Palo Alto. Uh, we have a pretty um, uh, forward-leaning um, IT strategy. Uh, it's not just about you know, providing IT services to our community and to our city staff. Um, but you know, being the heart and, and, and uh, birthplace of Silicon Valley, it's also a platform for experiments. And so if you look at what we've been doing over the last couple of years and what we're going to do, it's uh, thinking and reinventing uh, the possibilities around how you deliver government. Um, and, and lots of people uh, are looking at that. Excellent. And Stu, what about you? Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Thank okay. you all for coming. It's a great conference. I hope the hackathon works out as well. The conference is kind of, it's great to see ideas put into practice. And I think that's one of the things that Jonathan has innovated here tonight in Palo Alto. But my name is is your mic uh, full? Yeah, is your mic full? There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's much better now. See, we need wearable technologies, don't we? These <laughs> old kind of things just don't work anymore. It's, it's <laughs> like getting set up for a video conference. You've always got 10 minutes no matter Wearable what. world, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Well, my name is Stuart Evans. Uh, I'm about to get mic'd up properly. This, this works for now. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Uh -huh. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon. I teach uh, innovation and entrepreneurship to our PhD and master's students in our engineering college. And uh, I'm really interested in this whole transformation that's going on, not just in wearables, but also in IT and also in a whole slew of other areas of software. I teach electrical computer engineers and software engineers. And there's a massive revolution going on right now. Absolutely, absolutely. As a writer for the Washington Times, right? For, I'm a West Coast correspondent. I'm also a was, I was a delegate for under Arnold Schwarzenegger. I served on the Geology Geophysicist Board for four years. I was uh, also a graduate of USC um, dealing with real estate and development, community development, and um, that for 10 years. So I find it very interesting because in politics right now, there's a lot of open source and hackathons that are being offered for free. If you guys haven't done a hackathon, don't forget that GlazeCon is having a hackathon after this event, which is really great. And the hackathon experience is wonderful because you're able to see every aspect from a developer to uh, uh, a UX designer to a pitcher and to a team coming together with hopefully a product that is usable and adaptable in a short time frame. Uh, let's talk about open sources with the cities. A lot of these cities are becoming more tech savvy, so these yeah, hackathons can uh, move forward. Well, what do you feel about <coughs> that, Jonathan? Uh, I want to take, I'm going to take the sort of data uh, angle on that. Okay. Um, uh, we, we finally are kind of reaching a point where I think we're getting to critical mass where governments are making uh, the data that we hold on behalf of communities available to communities. You know, uh, governments have been stubborn about that, so much so that we've had to have laws, right? The California right. Public Records Act, the, the Federal Freedom of Information Act. Uh, but now we're stepping up. I think cities are finally saying, you know, the data is yours. Um, we, as governments, hold on to it you know, temporarily. We're just custodians, um, but it's yours. So now you see this movement, terrific stuff being done in, in San Francisco. Uh, in particular, um, down in the South Bay where I'm at, we're also doing some interesting things. So uh, we feel it's, it's fulfilling an, ob a, a, an unmet obligation. Um, so the, the idea of, first of all, making the data available and then bringing in community to co-create solutions, um, that's what we think of when we think of open sourcing government. Right, right. Um, a lot of people don't know that that, that data is available, though, and how to utilize that open so source. So <coughs> the, the fact that there are hackathons that, that you guys are going in and you're explaining that, are you having representatives go there, tell them how to use it, show them examples so that when they do start their hackathons or even want to apply that sure. to their apps and use that component in their database? What are you doing yeah. to integrate that? No, it's a, really, it's a really insightful question because governments are really bad at marketing. Governments are really bad at telling the good stories. 
Like we get caught when we do bad stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we know that. Right, right. <laughs> like there's no doubt about that. But when we have something great to talk about, which I think open source and government right. is a great story, um, we're just not reaching out to the right people. So we're looking at different ways of doing that. We'll send representation to uh, meetups and to hackathons. We'll, to the best to extent we can, we'll advertise the opportunities on our city website. Um, but I think, you know, if you look at where we're at in the sort of time continuum, we're really at the beginning. Um, we're doing a poor job of it and we're getting better. Um, I think when a government sponsors a hackathon, and this past weekend was the national day, the second national day of civic mm -hmm. ha hacking, which uh, ha over 120 events in, wow. in over 100 cities around wow. the world. Um, biggest civic collaboration event in history. We know we're starting to do things better. Let's, let's go to the yeah. other side of it. The <coughs> student, I, I would love you to talk about the fact that a lot of people are concerned about that open source. There's the devil advocate against that. Because open source, most people yeah. like their privacy. So they don't, when they start to hear of these open sources and understand and identify that everything that there's out there could be about them, there's some um, questioning about that. What do you feel yeah, about that? Yeah, I think it's uh, more of a problem in Europe than it is, is in the US, but I think the, the, the downside of where But in Europe, it's been around for a little bit longer, correct? Well, I think people value privacy in a different way. I think here, here the ruse is that if you get it for free, then any data that you supply is you know, fair game to, to use. And I think there'll be changes in legislation, but the whole notion of privacy in this, this digital world is, is kind of spurious because you know, if, you, if your entire life is being logged, both by yourself and by your surroundings, how on earth does the old notion of privacy work anymore? When, where do you go? Do you go to an island where there's no, uh, mm -hmm. there's no signal? Where, where do you go to get privacy? So I think the whole notion of, of privacy, I think open source though provides the ability to share things in a way you couldn't do before. Not and I imagine that we'll work on a, on a solution, technological solution to privacy. I'm, I'm sure somebody will come out with a, a wearable kind of set of devices that block everything around you so you can maintain privacy that way. But I think, you know, our generation views privacy different to the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And I think the millennial generation realize that it's just not there in the same way that it was before. And so they really don't have the same thing. Open source in itself is more of a way of distributing software and, and distributing technology. And it's really lowered the cost. And so if anything, it's a cost driven thing. But I, I wanted to make one kind of uh, observation about Jonathan. He's been very, uh, uh, very humble because three years ago, he actually initiated the idea of a civic hackathon that President Obama's taken up and resulted in the thing that we did uh, over at the weekend. And I think the notions of getting public involved in co-creation is a really I also great feel thing. that there's a scary part of it. I mean, President Obama also just put on the platform uh, big data. You know about the big data movement and how he wants to expand data uh, to look at the bad guys and the good guys. And again, there is that thing against the Constitution. You know, we the people in order to form a more perfect yes. union, establish mm -hmm. justice and domestic tranquility. Where is domestic tranquility when we continue to feel that the American people feel invaded? Mm -hmm. There's an invasion that's going on, and mm -hmm. that is through technology. So how do you make yourself not be the invader or the bad guy and come off as not the enemy, but as the co-partner in that? Mm -hmm. Any of you guys want to take that? Well, Sorry, I, uh, I probably will defer most of the response to, uh, to Dr. Evans. Uh, <laughs> uh, try to keep out of that uh, that realm, given my role. Um, uh, uh, clearly, oh, come on, just just a little, just a little, just, just, just a little. little. We we definitely. Tell, will you? <laughs> <laughs> we we definitely look at big data and government as um, a benefit. I, I would like to think of it in terms, of, for example, um, when you have uh, community members reporting issues, let's say with their smartphones and we're aggregating that information, we can start to plot it against maps. And now we can start to see patterns. And it's what we like to call sort of being able to see the invisible. Right? We start to see, oh, it's interesting that um, there is more um, uh, unlawful dumping of stuff in a certain area or there's graffiti in the area or more abandoned bicycles. Um, when you look at individual instances, you can't see that, but when you look in aggregate and you plot it in a visual way, um, you get um, you get a great benefit. Um, and I think I, the only comment I can make really about the, the sensitive area you're talking about is, you know, with all this cool stuff, there's bad stuff, right? Um, can it be taken advantage of by people who don't have, you know, good, uh, good intentions? You know, if we can, with big data, weed out bad guys, we can avoid the, the, the chemical attack in a big American city, 
Um, that's, that's a debate we have to have, you know, because yeah. uh, we have the capability and we have to choose whether to do it or not. No, absolutely. In, in fact, one of the initiatives that, that Jonathan signed off on in, in Palo Alto and Menlo Park and Mountain View is to digitize all the elementary schools and then have the kids have location stickers. So if there's some kind of an emergency, you can locate the kids and, and, and make them safe. Uh, very quickly, and so that's one of the benefits of the technology. The downside is, you know, everybody's tracked all the time, right. and so the technology itself is kind of neutral. It's just how you use that technology. I, I think one of your biggest challenges is getting the consumer to trust, because when you think about how the fact that you have all these trackers, yeah. and you're slowly implementing if they're on your arm, on your wrist, if they're like Muse that can <laughs> that have you feel the mind, um, no, the people are looking at that, saying, um, all this data is being collected on my children on my family, on my life. I'm not happy with that. I mean, let's take, for example, what happened recently in Cuba. Um, there was a fake Twitter created by the NSA. I don't know if you guys know that or not. And that fake Twitter account basically tracked people. And what they did was they had people on there who were social media managers, and they were trying to go against Fidel Castro. So they wanted to get riled up within the people. They later on tried to deny it. It was exposed. Um, you know, these objects are done in other countries. Who knows what they're doing to us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the big, the big point is we're in uncharted territory. Yeah. I mean, we've never had this type of capability as, a, um, as, as communities and as a humanity. Um, and we're making a ton of mistakes, to be honest with you. Um, but we're also getting great advantages. I mean, no one can doubt that the information revolution has brought amazing benefits to the planet. True, very true, very true. Um, and I, I just feel when I kind of review the news myself and, and even the instances you, you cite, I'm like, you know, this is the sort of like the nonsense that goes on when you're sort of figuring stuff out. Um, and, you know, the, I, I, I think what you see here is the technology is ahead of the legislation yeah. and policy. <coughs> yeah. That's true. Th yeah. This wearables world is, is nothing in writing yet. Now, yeah. in the legal side of things, it's actually very important. We've seen some people sue each other about the patent infringements and things like that. And, you know, how, how does it work? What's the IP that's developed? Who, who owns the IP? Right, where, right. where are the standards going to come very from? Very good question. Because I always think about insurance companies as well. If they have the right and have the access to that knowledge base, yep. they can look at the pattern. Your mom has heart issues, your dad, your cousin, your uncle, mm -hmm. and then you're the second or third generation. They might be able to use that against you yeah. and not insure you or insure your family all because of all this database Absolutely. that's being fact, collected. So where is the legality? Yeah, the in fact, one of the, one of the hottest companies in the Valley now just got $60 million yesterday in Ben Benefits to do benefits, and they monetize by having insurance companies get the data, data so they can do things with it. So they give the software away for free, and they get their money from, from Blue Cross Blue Shield or wherever. Absolutely. And so it is a, it is a danger. But, uh, you know, <clears throat> one of the problems is if, if you focus on the 10% the of the margin, that probably not doing good instead of the 90% that's really doing some incredible things. I mean, it's really nice to monitor elderly patients, your family, know where they are in the house, know they're not falling down, and having a whole host of information that you didn't have before. And I think to trade that off against the, the, the 5 or 10% of the margin is something we need to do very carefully. And I think one of the problems with legislators is they're not technology savvy to be able to understand mm. the implications. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. You know, a lot of people, I always tell you, being a native of California, our elected officials have been in office for too long, anywhere between 30 to 40 years. And there's an age issue going on. A lot of the yeah. uh, leaders, the yeah. senators and congressional leaders, are very, very old. And they're in their 70s or 80s. They're not tech savvy. So they rely a lot on their staff. So we have an innovation yeah. age gap there. It's yeah. not being biased or prejudiced against the age, it's against technology and the split of that. Yeah, and that's one of the nice things about working with, with college uh, students because you get in touch with what's going on much quicker than you do if you just keep your own. But well, how do you, um, how do you uh, monetize that friction? Because there's a lot of friction and you've got to make it smooth. You've got to make a smooth transition. How do you do that? Between well, Jonathan's not in monetization business yet. They're tech wearable. <laughs> Um, well, I, before I answer that question, I did want to just uh, give the counter argument about the, I mean, be more optimistic about the future of the, our politicians. I mean, our, regardless of what you think about certain individuals, you know, political slants, uh, Gavin Newsom, the, the lieutenant governor, um, has an amazing vision for the future of uh, cities and totally gets technology. Um, there's just several folks in, um, in, uh, uh, in, 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 in Congress and also, um, Yesterday, uh, during the election, making it real relevant, uh, the, uh, the fight for 
the Secretary of State role, the primary on that, one of the individuals, Pete Peterson, um, he, his entire platform is technology. He, he is going, he wants to be Secretary of State to use technology to make the state better. Um, so positive story, it's, it's a little one right now, but um, uh, now you'll have to ask me the other question because I'm not entirely sure I remember. <laughs> you know, um, no, I, and I appreciate that. We did have a major election, and, and yeah. it's, still um, it's still in conjunction with what we're talking about, yeah. where we have an older generation versus a newer generation. So what you're saying is because of the election, we have candidates that are running uh, that are tech savvy. I think that's an important part as a constituent. You as individuals, yes. not only in the tech world, but non-techie people have to keep in mind, yeah. if we elect officials, what do we hold them accountable to, and are they current yeah. with the times? Because it's going to be uh, detrimental to us as innovators to try to even get crowdsourced funding yeah. or venture <coughs> capitalist funding if your legislation yeah. are working against you and creating all these new bills and things tied in to mm -hmm. hold it back. Yeah, so the, the, it's the, important the, that we elect The good side of the technology issue is that if, the, if, if they're having wearable devices on them as well, <laughs> there you we go. know what they're doing. We know and what they're doing. So we, you know, all of the stuff that goes on behind closed doors and smoky rooms. If they're, if they're willing to wear it, you know. Well, maybe they have to. Too. But, but that comes from the people. That means that we have to write a bill yeah. that uh, puts that on the table. See, that's an American thing. You have Absolutely. to put a bill on the table yeah, yeah, yeah. and make your elected <laughs> officials uh, want to wear Well, maybe they'll not be able to get away from it you know, with cameras everywhere and everything that they buy and sure. stuff like that. I mean, that's one, of, that's one of the concerns that many governments had with, with iPads being made in China. You know, are they, are they safe? Absolutely. You know, Jonathan, let me ask you. Let's talk about city versus county. Because mm. some of these counties are very big. L.A. County is... Mm. Uh, not as large as San Bernardino County, but mm -hmm. we know that the density of the uh, people who live there in mm -hmm. LA County is very huge. I'm from LA. And then, of course, we have the Bay Area. Yeah. How are you tying those two together? What are they doing to make it um, sure. more educational transaction sure. about wearable devices? Sure. Okay. So um, we, we, we have work to do in this area. My goodness. Um, you know, the, there, there are four key cities that constitute Silicon Valley. And none of us work together. It, we repeat everything. We all each for every forty has their own data center. Sure. Every forty has mostly has their own police force. We we're, we're, we don't do shared services. We're not coordinated. I think technology has the potential to to start to think that up. In uh, in our area in Palo Alto, we we um, had a very unique project where we worked with Mountain View and um, Los Altos to have a one nine one one system. And and so. Um, you know, with an audience like this, you listen to that and you say, well, so what? I mean, that seems so obvious. It's so rare. It's so rare. It's, it's not happening. And you can probably imagine there's political reasons, you yeah. know, uh, elected officials are focused on, you know. I don't know if you're using this. Um, have you guys ever had this? I call it like an amber alert on your phone. Mm -hmm. You ever seen all of a sudden your phone say, there's someone in your radius area, yeah. they're driving, such and yeah. such. And, and then I'll talk to somebody, I said, did you get this? And they go, no. And I, I'll get on Facebook and there's a section of it and then we all know where we each other are at. Yeah. This is kind of a new thing. Yeah. What are, can yeah. you explain what that is? Well, I'm, I, I, I'll talk about it in the, something that we use every day that kind of answers both your questions. Um, I, on, on, the, on the one end, there's little or no coordination between you know, cities and counties. It's very poor, unless it's, it's a requirement. Right. Um, but there is a facility similar to what you're describing that's a Santa Clara County uh, alert, so FEC alert, alert, and all the uh, uh, engaged communities can participate on that. And we use it on a fairly regular basis. So there is a little bit of sort of a governance, you know, you, you, not everyone Do can Do you just get people complaining? Because it is kind of annoying, you're working yeah, all of yeah, a sudden, yeah. your phone goes beep, 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 you're like, what's <laughs> going on? And it's a, it's a different sound. Yeah. Um, have anybody received those texts? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Okay, there's a couple we're, of people we're actually out there. Working, we just got a research grant, a million dollar research grant, to try and work on some more effective ways of, of messaging in, in, in emergencies because, you know, one of the things that happens in emergencies is that all the communications goes down. So right. how do you coordinate? And so that's one area where wearable technology really comes into its own for people, mm -hmm. for first responders, for the police force, the fire brigade, and, and, and first responders, and the nurses and stuff like that. And if we know where these people are, it really makes a difference. And I think that's one of the things that we need to do is no longer can the emergency services work in isolation from the public. So there has to be coordination amongst yes. the community yes. as much as amongst the forces themselves. Much so, much so. We've got about two minutes left. left. Let me ask you this. <coughs> for the takeaway for the audience, where do you see the future of wearables sure. and uh, devices in government and on the constituent? Okay, so I'll be as fast as I can on it. Uh, I think the big play, so two things, a couple of kind of basic points. Um, uh, people are moving into cities. We're becoming an urban planet, right? We just 
it was about two or three years ago we went from uh, majority rural to majority urban. And in the next sort of 20, 30 years, another two billion people moved. So we're all living in cities. Cities were built for last century. They're not built for the century ahead. Yeah. We have to retrofit our cities, right? Um, we're living in cities that um, uh, have an operating system for uh, things we don't do anymore and a lifestyle we don't have anymore. Um, so between now and the end of the, the decade, only another six years, there's about a hundred billion dollar opportunity for this big area called smart cities. And within smart cities is where we'll so I've got cities. someone out there and they have an app or they mm -hmm. have a device. What mm -hmm. would you propose to them and, and, and what would be the next thing should they focus on? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I would clearly be encouraging people to participate in, in, in the opportunity with government. Um, traditionally, startups have just fed the sort of consumer market. So free sourcing that you have, mm -hmm. a data to them to use, databases. So we have data that they can use, but we also have an open mind. I mean, there are city halls now that want to welcome ideas. Uh, I would say explore the smart city space. Is there any money available? Th there's, it's an over a hundred billion dollar. From yeah. the state. Um, is it in grant form or is it what, in what format? Ah, okay. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an array of sources of, uh, of, um, of money for people. I, I think most of the funds are going to come from the private sector. I think that there's an incredible opportunity to invest in new companies. Uh, Sierra Ventures invested $2.3 million in a, a new in interface, tactile interface for wearable devices out of Carnegie Mellon. And I think there's a lot of opportunity and you'll see a very big kind of uh, investment move in this space in the, in the very short term. I agree. Well, my name again is Shirley Hussar. I'm with the Communities Washington Times. Go to Urban Game Changer because I believe in changing the games in the urban communities and I think that's going to make a big difference too. Many people are living together. There's a lot of mixed use development that's happening in, at least in the state of California and a lot of people don't want to drive as much. Gas is so high. So innovation <coughs> and uh, the communication is tighter. As big as our world is, it's becoming smaller. Thank you so much, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thank you very Thank much, you very Shirley. Much. really appreciate it. Thank you.